Okay, so it says, uh, for each of the decays below, give the total kinetic energy carried away by the decay product particles. Yeah, so I think most of this is a, a table looking up exercise. <laughs> so, and I think in the hint, I link you to, yeah, I, I link you to here. And I think the errors that were in table 11.1, .1, they didn't fix all the errors. I think you can refer to the table because they, the most significant error for the purpose of this question was the mass of the neutral K meson. And I think they fixed that. But uh, you know what? Let's just work with the thing that I know has no error in it or if they did, they should have fixed it. <laughs> so, uh, so let me just uh, show example of, um, let me do two of them. So, um, so A and B are both mesons, pi meson, K meson. Uh, C and D are both, uh, they both involve um, uh, baryons, sigma baryon uh, decaying into neutron, one of the baryons, or sigma naught decaying into a lambda baryon. So let me do B and D uh, as an illustration of looking up the table. So for the, so in order to answer B, th these are what I need. Uh, for B, I need the mass of the neutral K meson. Sometimes charged particles have different mass. So make sure you look up the right one. And I need masses of the charged pions. And Again, sometimes a different amount of charged versions have a different mass, so be careful. I happen to know that uh, positive and negative charged pions are particle-antiparticle pairs of each other, so they will have the same mass. But um, in general, do be careful because like if you're looking up uh, baryons, delta baryons, uh, delta plus and delta minus are not particle-antiparticle and won't have the same mass. Okay, so let me look up those two masses. So, so I could look up summary tables, but you know, I think I did a summary tables before. So, uh, you know, this is where I'm, okay. Yeah, so let me do that. Um, I wonder if I can, so I can definitely scroll through here. That's one. Wonder if I can do this, uh, pi, what? I don't know. Uh, pion? Uh, never mind. I don't know. <laughs> I've never used the search functions, and I guess I won't. Um, so, this is the meson summary table, meaning they uh, whittled down the information to the kind of bare minimum necessary. So, oh, I have my charge to pion right away, and there's my mass, mass of the charge to pion. Let me write them down. And from the way it's listed, I can see that it's listing both of them as I knew they would. 139.57, that should be enough precision. Okay, so I need to find the K meson. Um, scroll down, ADA, that's not it. Um, these are all kind of excited states. Um, I'm just gonna scroll through them. Um, yeah. A lot of, um, they, they are listing it by their quark composition. All these mesons have only up and down quarks, uh, no strange quarks. So, um, when I reach way down, almost there, I think I can feel it. There are this strange mesons. So now they are beginning to list the mesons that have strange quarks in them. Now um, I'm looking for neutral K meson. So don't write this down. Neutral K meson has different mass. So, you know, look at 493.7, that's the charged one. The neutral K meson that you will see when you scroll down is 497.6. So it's, uh, it has a similar mass, but it has definitely has different mass. And I think in this question, it'll be different enough to actually matter in grading. Six one and maybe. So yeah, that those are the masses. And the rest is kind of a simple arithmetic you can do on a calculator. So 
the simple arithmetic is <laughs> uh, mass of the neutral k-meson for 97.61 minus the rest energies that are on the right hand side two of these so 139.57 139.57 minus another one of those, 139.57. So 218.47 is the difference between rest energy on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And that is uh, my answer for that amount of released kinetic energy. So let me do that for D as well. And then uh, and uh, let me start with the... the the Feynman diagram drawing exercise is here. Um, yeah, yeah, um, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and if I need to come back to these tables and look it up, I guess I'll do that. Uh, in fact, let me open this up on a separate tab. And let me, so for part D, I need my baryon table. And um, it can simplify your lookup if you know their rough quark content because they are listed in that order. But um, you know, if you don't remember it, then you just scroll through it more slowly and deliberately. So I'm gonna need to find the mass of the sigma neutral sigma baryon. Um, don't be distracted by the charged ones you're gonna see. And I'm gonna need mass of the neutral lambda. I think the lambda is also better yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't, yeah, you just have to know. Um, and gamma is a photon, photon has a zero rest energy. So these are the two masses I need to look up and let's find them. It's the baryon summary table. It'll again be ordered by quark content. So I'm gonna, it's gonna start out with the baryons that contain only up and down quarks. And I think both of those baryons have at least one strange quark. So I don't expect to see sigma and lambda for quite some time. Yeah, so here's a neutron. And these are all kind of excited states. Um, and then they should also list the things like a delta baryon at some point. And yeah, delta baryon. It's still only up and down quark. What's the difference here is that it has a nuclear spin, it has spin of three half. So that's interesting. <laughs> and we are scrolling. Uh, okay, there it is, lambda baryons. Okay, uh, it has strangeness of minus one, yeah, one strange quark. Um, or so here they are giving the quark composition for only one of them, the neutral lambda baryon. Uh, for all the other lambda baryons, you can kind of figure out their quark composition by looking at the um, looking at the charge, because with the combination of up, down, and strange, knowing the charge kind of constrains what their quark composition should be, and and the limitation that it has only one strange quark. Um, so lambda zero, um, wait, is there any other? Yeah, there's charge to lambdas. I think there's lambda minus. Um, let me just to make sure I am right that there is lambda minus. Um, oh, no. Down, down, strange is a sigma. Okay. Um, oh, I guess nuclear. No, I is not spin. That's a, um, that's a isospin. Um, okay. So I think a lambda baryon is in what's called isospin singlet state. That's why there's only one of them. So that is the only. So this quark composition and the this neutral lambda baryon. That's it. There's no other. So. Uh, so, so, um, so that's the mass of the lambda baryon, one 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 five point six eight MeV. There should be enough precision. Um, let's do sigma baryon. And actually, while I have this, uh, uh, I'll look it up later if I need to. <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking about the quark composition because right after doing first these first two parts, I want to draw some Feynman diagrams and you have to know the quark composition to do that. Uh, um, I'll, I'll see if I can remember. 
Okay, sigma variance. So sigma variance come in three combinations. They are giving you the three possibilities here, up, up, strange, up, down, strange, and down, down, strange. And because up and down quarks have different charge content, uh, it, they, these differences result in differences in the electric char electron charge. And it doesn't matter for our purposes here, other than to make sure that we are looking at the correct mass, not sigma plus, but sigma zero, because the rest mass will be slightly different and that difference is enough to matter. Um, one, one, nine, two, point six, four, and Okay. Um, well, I think I can do this calculation in my head. I'm subtracting two numbers. So it should be, oh, I mean, I say I can do it in my head, but can I is the actual question. Uh, 70, I want to say 6.96, six, is that right? It would be so embarrassing if I'm wrong. Um, Okay, I think that's right. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, all right, yeah. So we did a calculation for two of the processes and I trust that you can do the rest to yourself. So what I want to use that time I'm saving by not doing the other two is I want to show you how these decay processes are represented using Feynman diagram. Uh, B is a more interesting one. So let me start out with a B. Um, so, so this is, uh, let me first write out the decay process in, um, with the, the quark composition. That way I know what uh, particle lines to draw in my Feynman diagram. So K meson, neutral K meson going in, is going into pi plus and pi minus. And if I'm remembering my quark composition correctly, the neutral K meson had a quark content of dyne, uh, down an anti-strange quark that's going to the pi plus. It's a combination of an up and down quark and anti-quark pair. And the only way you can get plus is by combining up with uh, anti-down and pi minus. Um, the only way you can get negative charge is combining down with the anti-up. Okay, so, so these particle lines are what I need to draw. Lines for down quark, strange quark, and up quark, down quark. And as you're looking at it, I hope you realize that um, the, the quark contents don't match. Um, I have a strange quark here, and that's gonna disappear. And I hope you are not surprised. This is kind of what we talked about in talking about the weak interaction that quark flavors are one of these approximately conserved quantities. It's conserved in electromagnetic and strong interactions, but the one process that won't conserve quark flavor is the weak interaction. So when I draw a Feynman diagram here, it is going to involve weak interaction bodices. So, so on the left-hand side of my external lines, I'm gonna have one down quark come in. I think that down quark will probably become one of these down quarks. So let me just plan for that. There's one down quark going up and I have one anti-strange quark coming in. And I draw this arrow opposite to indicate it's an antiparticle. And this is gonna uh, turn into a quark anti-quark pairs or I guess it's gonna, well, um, um, it, it's gonna turn into three quarks. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna turn into um, one of the anti-quarks and then there's gonna be uh, one an quark anti-quark pair that uh, produces. So this is where you kind of have to know the uh, elementary vertexes for these interactions. For weak interactions, you have elementary vertexes that look like this. You have one quark that comes in, that turns into another quark. And in doing that, it emits a W boson. So in a process like this, up quark turning into down quark, this would be emitting W plus boson. 
so that your charge is conserved. You have plus two thirds here. If you add a plus one with a minus one third, you have plus two thirds here. So this is a strange quark. It's kind of like a version of down quark. So it's going to turn into an up quark or more strictly it's gonna turn into an, um, uh, turn into an uh, anti up quark. In the process of doing that, this, so it's going from plus one third to minus two thirds. So it needs to emit a W boson, that's W plus. And, oh, let me just connect these down quarks together. And this, this virtual W boson, it's going to decay. It's going to decay to a quark anti quark pair that has a total charge of, a total charge of, a, <laughs> of plus one, and that combination will be up and anti down, I think. So it's going to turn into a quark anti quark pair. And let me be careful here. So when these um, final particles heteronize, when they form bound states of meson and, well, meson, uh, they have to be combined in the combination of uh, particle and antiparticle, particle and antiparticle. So the way it comes out, this will have to uh, combine into up and anti-down. Oh, so I think the combination that I drew here is the other possibility where these are neutral pi mesons, which is not what I was looking for. So I have to draw this a little bit differently. Let me redraw that because actually um, this interaction and the one that I was supposed to draw looks slightly different, especially, um, yeah, yeah. So to, for me to draw that right, this is how I have to draw it. I have to draw this uh, anti-strange quark turning into an anti-up quark. And actually these will hadronize and form one of the pions. And the W boson that's emitted here, it's gonna decay into pair of uh, particle and antiparticle. This will be up quark, this will be anti-down quark. So these combinations will become pi minus, and this combination will become pi plus. In fact, I think this particular possibility, I talked about it in lecture, and I want to talk about this a little bit more uh, next week, because this is a great example to look at and how you can get um, some information from symmetry consideration. Um, I think I mentioned something about branching ratios in the lecture briefly, and we can go more into that next week in more detail. Let me do Feynman diagrams for the second process. Um, the sigma, neutral sigma baryon um, decaying into the neutral uh, and the baryon. So it's got a photo. So let me first write down my quark content so that I know what I'm going to be drawing. So my neutral sigma baryon is turning into lambda baryon plus a photon, hmm. Okay, so neutral sigma baryon, as we were looking at, it had, uh, well, actually neutral lambda baryon is the one I remember. It had up, down, and strange quark. And I think a sigma baryon actually has the same quark content, up, down, and strange. <coughs> because given the, restrictions and choices, that's the only choice. That's the only combination that will result in this neutral charge. Um, I mean, the interaction, it's, you know, conserves energy. There's enough energy there to give this much to gamma, the, the photon. So, um, so I think it's fine. I think this particular Feynman diagram is gonna look a little bit silly. So I'll just draw it and then move on. So, um, and it, it's going to look silly in kind of two different ways. Um, um, so how do I put it? Um, so, uh, well, let me just to draw it. So I have up, down, and strange quarks. So each baryon uh, at the fundamental level consists of three particle lines. 
that represents the quark content. And they actually, especially at this uh, low mass end, they tend to be more complicated than that. You know, these are bound to each other. They're constantly exchanging gluons. So the way I'm drawing it, it's really underplaying the complexity here. And now these quarks are turning into um, the quarks in the lambda baryon. And to the untrained eye, nothing is happening <laughs> up down strange quark. So what I need to insert to, to represent that, that there's an emission of a photon here. Is, so all these particles, they carry charge. Up quark carries a charge of plus two thirds A. So since it has the greatest, greatest magnitude of charge, let me associate this vertex with up quark, but it's not necessarily that way, but I'm going to. So at the vertex, you have the, the elementary QED vertex. So in elementary QED vertex, what you have is um, charge the particle coming in and going out and it emits a photon. That's an elementary QED vertex. So at this vertex, you have a photon that's being emitted. And that's it. And to some degree, this looks kind of silly, especially because if I had attempted to draw this as just one particle, I've actually would have drawn something that's not physically possible. One, you know, if these had been elementary particles, they are neutral. How does a neutral particle interact with the electromagnetic thing? And if this had been elementary particles, then also this entire process is not something that could conserve energy and momentum. Um, but with the sigma baryon and lambda baryon, it is possible because there's internal structure as the up quark um, gives us this energy, the binding energy between the quarks can change. But in terms of diagramming it, so this Feynman diagram is probably not as calculationally useful, but this is how you do diagram it uh, with one uh, elementary QED vertex and kind of spectator quarks that are going by.